So my name is long. So tilde far dot Suleimanlu slash submit is a very long thing to type. Uh, edit your dot bash profile and add an alias like this. You see alias f sub tilde far dot Suleimanlu slash submit. You see that? So every single time you are doing it, you don't have to type that big thing. Just type f sub, and it's it it's an alias for that command. So you don't you don't have to keep doing it. Okay. So keep that in mind. I probably add that one to the uh, um, to the readme file of the notes, so you see how it's done. So again, if I say f sub, which essentially means submit to me. So it's 244, the section is NAA. You need to know what is your section, either A or B. It's not NAB. You are in either section A or B. Take a look at the, your schedule. It tells you what is your lab. So you use that one, and it's workshop 01, I think, and then WS, and then put over here dash do. So if you do dash do, it tells you exactly when the workshop is due. When you are in lab, you have to do attendance. And when you do that, it checks the IP number of your computer to see if you are in the lab. So you cannot submit from this location. You have to be in that lab. So the first day that I go to the lab, I'm going to log into one of the computers and see in what subnet mask you are in. And I'm going to add that one. So only through that lab. For that reason, answer to your question, you have to only open one terminal client. You cannot have an open, open terminal client from your laptop and one from the computer. Okay? You should have only one terminal client open on the computer lab and run that attendance thingy, and you're clear. It means I'm in, I'm in the lab. Okay? Or ask your friend to do it for you. I don't know. <laughs> nah. Okay, don't do that. But anyways, so... So yeah, you do that, then the attendance is going to pass through. But of course, if you are sick or you have problems, you can't come to the lab, you send me an email, and I'll know that you can't come, then I will make sure that uh, um, I'll set it up so you get your mark. Okay? So your attendance is necessary, even if you have finished your lab successfully, come to the lab and help others and get used to it. That's called collaboration. Yes. I want to say yes, but sometimes you're sick and you don't go to the doctor. You just have a terrible headache and you're sitting at home where you just, you know, have heard some bad news and you don't come. So I'll try to be as liberal as possible on this. But if I see I'm getting five requests every day, then I'm going to ask for that. Okay, but if everybody is civilized, then for labs only. I don't need doctors at all, okay? Uh, mm, but if, like, you cannot do the test and exam, then it's not of my hands. You have to do it. Uh, any questions? Okay, submissions are by request and for valid reasons. Uh, sorry, extensions. Okay, so if you have any problem with extension, like you want an extension on something, and uh, don't tell me, I'm stuck in lab two and I want extension. Too bad. You shouldn't be stuck because the time that we are giving is for you when you study to be able to hand in. Okay? Then you're going to submit it late and you get late penalty. But, so that's not a good reason. I'm stuck and I'm, and I'm late. That's not a case. Okay? But if anything else happens and out of your control you cannot submit it, please let me know and I'll add an extension for you. All the students with accommodation, your extensions will be hard-coded into the system so the system recognizes you when you are submitting and automatically will apply this ex extension that the school provides for you. So you're going to get that. You never need to tell me when you are using the submitter. Okay? Uh, any questions before we begin? All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay, so let's bring this over here. We said, hello, we said that, we said that,
C++ is a superset of C language. When we say superset, it means C is a subset, <laughs> which means anything. Um, why do they call it C++? Anybody knows? Mm, almost. He said more features than C. Anybody knows why they call the language C++? What is P++? <laughs> what is plus plus? What, does a, what is the meaning of plus plus in C language? Add one, right? C++ language is a feature that has only, is a language that is C with one additional feature. That is object orientation. That's why they call it C++. Okay? Yeah, and there are lots of uh, people who did not like C language, so they make fun of the language. They say C++ has bug even if it's in its name, which means the language must be over before actually the feature can be added to it because plus plus is after C. They should have called it plus plus C, <laughs> but they call it C plus plus. Anyways, so, so that's the thing. Now, there are many side effects to the language when we actually move from a structured language into, a C, into an object-oriented language. The, first of all, the way we are thinking around problems has to kind of change. You used to program in a way to see how things are happening. So you had series of actions, and you programmed them, and you had a program. First, I'm going to do this. Then I'm, first, I'm going to get the marks. Then I'm going to find the average. And then I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to do So you went through the steps, and you did programming, right? In C++, everything's object-oriented, which means what we are going to do over here, we have to think about what are the actors of the system. When I'm actually, let's say if I want to find average of a series of marks, the very first thing that I have to think is that, okay, what is this mark for? It's for a test. So I'm going to say I have an object, something called test. That test has a mark, right? And I have to now tell to the test how to get its mark. So in previously, if you remember that we were talking about like C language, we said C language is structured and it doesn't have encapsulation. And encapsulation essentially was integration of data and logic. Integration of data and logic. And we said C++, if it hap C language, if it happened in real life, it would be a very scary thing. And I told you that if you wake up at night and you hear a hello, from thin air with nobody saying it, you're going to probably pee in your pants, right? Because you heard something without anybody being there. That's structured programming. Actions don't have owners, right? In object orientation, every action comes from an owner. So if I have a test and that test has a mark, mark needs to know how to get its own uh, test mark. Sorry, test needs to know how to get its own mark. And uh, that's how things work. So every single thing, entity, we train that entity to take care of its own stuff. So if I want to have, if I want to have, if I want to actually create something to find the average of the, of the marks, First, I'm going to create an assessment, test, whatever you are calling, with all its properties. Then I'm going to create a transcript that holds or uh, a class of students who have, like depending on what the averages are, if I want to, have, if I want to find the average of, of mark of a student in a semester, if that's the case, then I'm going to create a transcript that holds many assessments. And then I'm going to tell to transcript how to go through all the assessments and get, uh, find the average of all the marks. And, then t and the transcript will learn how to do all the, so it's like a hierarchy of a company. You're going to have a transcript. Transcript has lots of assessments. When you tell to transcripts to get the marks, the transcript says assessment number one, 
get your mark. Assessment number two, get your mark. It doesn't get involved with getting the mark. Assessment knows how to get its own mark. All it does, the boss that is transcript tells to its employees that are assessments to do their job. So every single piece of object that you have in the code should be able to do its own thing. And therefore, if you have a proper design of a system exactly as is in the real world, because you are designing it the way it is in the real world, it will work. If I design a transcript the way a transcript is on paper, then all I need to do is say transcript, shoo, and the transcript's going to go do all these, all its own stuff. It's going to go find its own student. It's going to find out the mark of the student. It's going gonna, it's gonna to set everything, and then you're going to say transcript, give me the report. And it's going to print you, and you're going to see the paper version of the object in the thing. This is object orientation. Now, what is the implementation for it? If we were in, oh, First, I have to tell you a few things about Maine. Uh, some of the things that I tell over here is from three, it's going to be in three, four, five. I'm just going to give you a hint of it, but you don't need to know, okay? Like this, like this part. Uh, so I'm not going to ask this in a quiz. So for those people who, don't, who are only studying to get marks, don't listen, okay? And I just noticed few of you are a little too focused on your screen, okay? And few of you are too focused on your friend's screen. Remember what I told you? If I see too much distraction, I'm not going to allow laptops in my class. Remember that, okay? I'll, a, a, a teacher knows when I just look at it. Have you ever walked in the street, see people holding their cell phones, walk like zombies, okay? I, I don't want a class like that. I don't want a zombies as my students, okay? so. Uh, if that continues to happen, then I'm going to ask you to, to close your zombie device, okay? And uh, get, uh, be with us, okay? All right. It's very... Let me pause this. Okay. All right. So, main. First, you always have a return schmiggly dinghy at the end of the main. You see that return zero? Where does that thing go? Where does that integer go? That return thing, when you say return zero, you know functions. You know when a function returns something, it returns something out, right? Okay, where does it go? Anybody knows? Uh, okay, who runs your program? Your program runs under the... Who compiles your program? Compiler, okay? After you compiled the program and got executed, who runs your program? Your program runs where? No, it doesn't run in a RAM. So you, if, if it runs in a RAM, why you're buying a computer? Go buy 25 bucks, couple of RAMs, and you're good to go. On CP, so boy, go buy a CPU and you're good to go. What is it running on? Come on. You need to know this from... Uh, IPC and ULI, where, the, where does your program run? Come on, hurry up. Someone, volunteer. No? Oh my goodness, why everybody's doing It runs on your computer. Static memory, RAM, CPU, no, it runs on your computer. And who runs it? The operating system, Windows. Windows, probably if it's Linux, Linux, Mac, your OS runs it. So your OS runs your program. Now, question is, when your program runs, what is the function that is called so your program can run in C language? Which function is called first? You know that. I know you know. Main, right? And please use your opera voice. Don't go, oh, main. You know what I mean? Answer the questions as if you're, like, you're, you're, you're boss of the thing, you know? Main, be loud, OK? So, so yeah, so it's main. Therefore, operating system is calling main, correct? So whoever calls main will receive the return statement value. Therefore, that return zero returns that zero to the OS. Okay? So if I actually write over here one, two, three, four, five, 
for whatever reason and compile this beautiful code of mine. So if I say over here, uh, da, 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 build. So I compiled the code and built in everything. So it creates the executable three years la later for me. Now I'm going to go to the uh, go to the directory. Now I'm going to go to the directory. I hate this automatic thing. OK, there you go. Uh, so that's the directory. Copy. Now I'm going to go to command line just to show you what's going on. So D column, CD, CD debug. We have done this before, right? So that's your executable, 03 January AB, correct? All right. Now I'm going to say echo percent error level. It's zero, right? The error level is zero. Now I'm going to say 03 January yada yada exe. Now I'm going to put that error level again. What is the value? One, two, three, four, five. So essentially, it's a message your main is sending back to operating system. Why? So you can tell to whoever is running your program to see if it was successful or you had a problem. Have you ever run a program and it says, your program ended with the error message 1295632? That's the one. OK? So remember, that return statement is a message you are returning back to the OS. And there is another thing, too. In C language, you know array of strings, right? You know array of strings? OK, so when you actually write main, you can write the main with two arguments, int argc, and you can write over here character pointer, argv. So essentially, argv is an array of strings which means argv0 is the first string, argv1 is the second string, argv2, and it keeps going like that, OK? So, and this argc tells how many arguments you have, which means what arguments. So if I say over here, January something over here, where is it? And January something something, and I say over here, hello. That's not hello, that's geki, whatever is geki means. OK, if I say hello there, how are you? And I do something like this. And if I hit enter over here, nothing happens, right? But if I go over here and write a little loop, integer i for i set to 0, i less than argc, and i plus plus. And I simply over here print. You know, see out prints, right? argvi. One by one, I print them, and I go to new line. Now if I rebuild the code of mine, and I go back to that, oh, what happened? I have a semicolon missing somewhere, yeah. So if I rebuild the code now, and I go back in here and run the exact same thing, I say, hello there, how are you? You see that? So you can actually pass information to your program from operating system and return afterwards some result to the operating system. I have lots of people come with curiosity, like, I see all these commands that are executed. How do they work? Like, you can write a copy command if you want to like this. First file, second file, you get the file names, you get open the first file, get the thing, put it in a... All the operating system in Linux is written like this. OK, that's essentially the code for it. So it's, thing, it's something that you need to know. OK, that's that. No, it's just a message. OK, you know what shell script is, right? You have done shell script, right? OK, what is dollar sign thingy in uh, dollar sign one, dollar sign two when you add? And dollar sign zero. OK, the name of the thing, right? So those are essentially the argc and argv that you see over there. And the value that it returns, I don't know Linux that well. What is the uh, result? Which one it goes to? 
I should have my wife over there. She's a Linux administrator. She knew. That's why I never learned. I never, I never ask her. So, so that's so again. Uh, in Linux, is the same thing. So when you're writing a shell script, you write an executable like you do a grep, and you want to see if your grep actually finds something successfully in your in your thing. It sets the operating system value to something. That's a return value. Okay, so you can design it to whatever you want and provide the manual for the person who's having your executable in their script to understand how things work. Okay? Essentially, that's how my submitter works, the submitter program that I have written. It's a C++ program working around Linux commands. It simply runs mail command and sees if it sends, so it checks the, the, the environment to see if everything's good and so on and so forth. It's very simple and straightforward. Okay, so... And that's not a C thing. What I showed you is not a C++ thing. It is C. What you see is C. It's not C++. Number two. So now that we know how main works, let's actually talk about objects and see how they work. Why we always return zero? Because return zero, zero is a unique number in, in, in uh, Every number is unique in <laughs> a series of integers, but it's a, it's a more distinguished one between all the numbers, right? It's something zero, so it means nothing, right? So usually when you return zero in any program, it means no error happened, everything was okay. It doesn't mean zero means true. It means nothing. Nothing happened. If you return a code, it means something happened and this is the code for it. Now go check the manual and see in my manual when I tell you I'm returning one, two, three, this is what happens, okay? I just, the reason that I told you this main thingy, just to tell you that everything works the exact same way in C and C++ language. When you have a function, all functions receive something. All functions return something. There is no exception. Even if you have a main that looks like a very special function, it's just a function. It has arguments that it receives, and it has something that it returns. Now, depending on what you want to return and stuff, you can change anything you want to change. Now, if you're working in C language and I ask you to design something like a student, what, would you, what, what will you do is to actually create a structure. You would create a structure in C language and say, my structure student has a name and it has an age. Let's say I want to see what are the ages of my students and have a statistic thing. I want to see what is the average of, a, of, a, of the age of a college student. Somebody asked me to do so. So my abstraction of a student is its name and its age. I don't, I don't care about the marks. I just want to do that thing. Okay? Depending on what you're designing, your abstraction of the, of the object changes. And please remember what I just told you. Remember, rem depending on how you're looking at an object and, and its purpose in your program, the identity, the encapsulation, the design of the object changes to satisfy your needs. It's an impossibility to completely encapsulate an object the way it is in the real world. If we do that, we're going to be master of universe. <laughs> okay, that's going to be ultimate AI. All right? We can't do that. We have to always look at an aspect and pick what we want and just ignore the rest so we can actually program it. That's why all the systems that are supposed to be smarter than us in a decade, they are all self-learning computers because we are incapable of doing it. We have to let it learn by itself and accumulate its own data. We cannot do it. Okay? So you have to learn how to do abstraction to be able to program. It's an important thing. Remember that. And uh, so that's the thing. So if I have a student like this and I want to actually print the student, what would I do in a, in a C thingy? I would actually create a, a function called print, right? And in that print function of mine, I will pass a student, correct? Now, if it was C language, I had to put over here struct student, correct? We don't, we don't do that in here. The difference between C++ and C, one of the side effects of object orientation is that any class that you create, any structure that you create, class, structure, potatoes, potatoes, they are identical, okay? Any structure or that class you create becomes a type. 
You don't have to have struct. It. As soon as I say struct student name age, student becomes something like int, like double. It becomes an, it becomes a type. What type of a type we call that? Who's ready to answer? You call that, a, you said something. What do you call that? No, not an object. We said we have, two, we have two types of types, remember? We have regular types, fundamental types, and we have derived types, and that we call them actually compound types, types that are made out of other types, right? So that's a student. It becomes a type, literally. You don't have to write struct anymore. You simply write student. And I'm going to say student S in here, student S. And what I'm going to do is simply, oh, that's that's new version of print called Pring. Anyways, so uh, print, so I'm going to say print student. And in here, I'm going to say C out, say C out S dot name, and then go to new line and say C out. Uh, s dot age and go to new line. That's the polymorphism that we are dealing with over here. C out is an object that it's designed to impersonate, to uh, represent your console output, your output console. Therefore, you say insert the name on the console. C out automatically knows it's a string and it's going to properly print it like a string. And when I say sh, it knows there is an integer coming in, and it's going to print the integer. OK? So that's how it works. You don't need to actually put a format. You don't need to put a percent %s, percent %d over there. C out knows. Because the insertion operator, as you see over here, that inserts information into the console is a polymorphic operator. What is polymorphism? What is polymorphic? Polymorphic, anyone? It means? Many forms. It means many forms. So it's a polymorphic thing. It has many forms. That operator has many forms. So therefore, it can automatically pick the one that is right and print that for you. Now, if I want to actually set a student to a value, then I'm going to say over here, void set student. S, right? Is that correct? No, it's not. It's a, I cannot pass it like I have to pass a pointer because I'm setting this student, right? If I'm setting this, I have to pass its address. If I just pass its thing, it's going to be a copy of the student. Nothing's going to happen. So I have to say address student pointer, and I put over here a P. Now in here, I'm going to say SD and O oh, and set the student to values, right? So it's going to be what? Uh, name, so constant character, uh, name, and uh, an integer age. So essentially what I need to do now is to say SDR copy into SP, SP's name, uh, the name that is coming in through that one, and in here I'm going to say int age, uh, sorry, uh, SP's age. is set to the age that is coming in. Now I can actually set the name of the student to whatever I want. Of course, if I want to have string header file work for me, I have to include it, right? I have to say, I have to say include string dot h. That does not exist in C language anymore. First of all, that include doesn't exist either. It's in lukud. Okay. OK, that is not right. We don't do that anymore. Remember when we're talking about namespaces? What did we say a namespace is? A namespace is a space we put names in it, right? And we said in the lab that the, all the old stuff, are put, uh, they are all set in the namespace std, right? And we said C++ for the library information, it doesn't need the header file anymore. So you don't need the .h for that. But there is a problem. Because string by itself is a separate entity in, in C++, they said anything that comes from C language into C++, you add a C at the beginning. So string header file becomes C string. 
Okay? So let's say if I, if I have a header file called standard library, if I want to say include standard library, if I want to say include std standard library dot h, I can't. I'm going to put cstdlib. If for some reason you want to use printf, if you want to, you can. As we said, C++ is a superset of C language. If for some unknown reason you want to use printf, you want to include standard input output, right? Include C standard input output. That's how it's going to be. So you put C at the beginning, it means this comes from C language, okay? And we know that when I do this, it's going to give me an error message telling me, hey, this is not safe. What are you doing? So let me just set. So I'm going to create a student, st, and I'm going to say set address of st to fardud and age I'm going to put over here 46. All right. I'm not 46. I wish, but hey. All right. And now I can say print over here. Uh, ST. All right? So that's how we did it. We created a, a, a structure, a record that represents what we want, and we wrote functions to actually set it to something. Anybody have any problems? A quick review of latest things that you have learned in C language. We're okay with this? The only thing that I removed over here was the keyword struct that we don't need this. If I build this program, if I compile this program actually, you will see that I get this error message. The error message says, SDR copy this function on unsafe. Consider using SDR copy S. No, don't do it. It's not a standard thing. It doesn't work in all platforms. Don't use it. Or Use this, define this to shut me up. Okay? Putting that thing at the top, you have to put it at the very first line of your program. There is no other way. You cannot put it after and include. It has to be there, and you say define, and then you put that thing, which means, hey, don't give me warnings. I know what I'm doing. Okay? So now if I run the program, I'm going to run it step by step. So I'm going to go F10 over here. And when I press F10, it essentially runs from, goes right to the beginning. You see that green thingy? Uh, sorry, that uh, yellow thingy? That is right at the beginning. I'm going to stick it to the left side. And this one is the execution for it. So it's going to come over here. It's going to get the far dude and call over here. So this becomes far dude and this becomes 46. It copies name to the name of the student that holds its address and it puts the name over there. So when we come out, if I look at the student over here, I'll see name is Fardud and age is 46. All right? And then it goes to print, passes that information to that student. So S over here becomes a copy, and it's a member-wise copy. So it blindly copies everything from one student to another byte by byte. It's like a Xerox copy. A Xerox copy doesn't know what is on your notes when you copy it. It just copies it. That's what this copying is. I have a student S, S over there at line 9, and I have an S, a student ST over here at line 18. When at line 20 I say print ST, it passes ST to S. Therefore, S becomes a copy of ST, and it's going to be a blind Xerox copy of ST into S. So it it essentially copies all bits and pieces of the SD, and then after that, it prints it, and it comes out. And because it's a correct copy, it does it. So it actually prints it. So that's how we did it in uh, C language, right? But that's not how we define things in C++. In C++, we teach the object to take care of its own stuff. You know what this thing looks like? Who is talking right now? Farad is talking, right? What is your name? Owen. Who just said Owen? 
Who talked? It was Owen. We both talked, right? When Owen talks, he talks like Owen. When Farda talks, I talk like Farda. We are both doing talking, but based on our objects of what we are and what is our vocal cords are and everything, our talking is different. But the action is identical, correct? Are we okay down to here? All right. Now, imagine that we couldn't, like, our talking would have been that I have a booth over here, like a telephone booth, and at the top it says, talk. And if I wanted to talk, I had to open and go to that booth and close it and start talking. Owen can't talk now. Has to wait for me to get out of the booth. I get out and then he goes in. And I get out and the other one goes in. That's that function, function over there. That print function doesn't belong to a student. It's just a print function that accepts a student. That's not right. That's not how things work in real world. In real world, every person knows how to do its own thing. Okay? So if I want to actually write this, so that's 0, 2, C, student. Now if I want to actually do this, what do I do? I'm going to actually say, no, this is not how a struct, oh, sorry, that's not the one. This is not how a student works. I'm going to say, a student, first of all, I just called set, and I changed the name of that poor student. It's like I'm going to name Owen Jack now. Hey, everybody, call Owen Jack. Why? Because he has no choice. I have the function set. As soon as he's in my function, I can change whatever he has. I can change his person. I can, I can change his age. Now he's 92 years old, not 29. I can do that. I can change the pro private properties of anything when I'm actually dealing with them. But when I actually want to do this as a C++ program, what I need to do is say, hey, first of all, nobody touches these. Which means, just take a look what happened. Look at the error under the thing on line 14, the print statement. It says, hey, what are you doing? Name is private. You can't touch it. Age is private. You can't touch it. Only the builder of that student can do it. You are not allowed to. Okay? Which we're going we're gonna to come to. And then I'm going to say, but there are some public capabilities that you can ask. You can ask a student to set its own stuff. And that student can choose how to do it depending on how you regulate it. So instead of actually creating something like that, I will print the set, bring the set function inside the structure, not outside. Therefore, everything that a student has is available to the set function. I do not need to pass anything to set. Set is part of the student now. If my head is itchy, I don't need to tell to my hand where my head is. It knows it. And if my head itches, I'm not going to itch his head. I'm going to do my own because my hand knows who I am. That's what it is. That set is a member of the student. And when it deals with the student, it says, first of all, in here, it's a regulation that we have that I'm adding right now. Remember that. When you are creating a variable inside a class, when I say class, you're hearing struct or class. Again, struct, class, potatoes, potatoes. They didn't want to create any class. Structure was exactly what a class was when they actually moved to C++. But because it's C++ and the C++ standard dictates that 
we have an entity called class, they say, okay, we're going to rename this structure and call it class so you can use them both. There's only one difference and one, and this is going to be in the quiz the next time you're coming in, okay? What is the difference between a structure and a class? A class, if I created a class over here instead of a student, if I said class, I didn't need to actually write private over here because a class is private by default unless you make it public. That's the only difference. A structure is public by default unless you change it. So class, if you go to an interview and somebody asks you what is the difference between a class and a structure, they would say nothing. One is default, by default private, the other one is uh, by default public. And that is the only difference. Okay? Remember that. All right? So I'm going to change it to class. But it doesn't mean it has to be a class. It has to be a class. It could have been a structure. Anyways, so now, and, I rem and remember, this is a regulation that you, that you have to follow in my class. It's, remember I told you we have regulations that we go through your coding? Any variable you create inside the class or a structure that is a member of that structure, not in a function, that is a member of, an, uh, of that structure, to make sure everybody on that, uh, understand that this is a member variable. Remember, in encapsulation, what it was, putting the data and behavior together, this is the data that we are talking about. This is the data that takes part in encapsulation. Those data started with M underline. Just to remind everybody, this is a member, people. This is a member. This is a member variable. It belongs to student. Okay? Not the functions. You don't need to do that. Okay? Now in here, when I want to do a string copy, I'm going to do M underline name. Okay? And for the age, I'm going to say M age. Do I need to tell which M age? No, I don't need to. Set is part of the student. It have access to all its properties. It is part of it. All parts of a class, they have access to the other parts. They don't need a qualifier for it. And that's why we have it like that. And if I want to print the name, then I'm not going to do it like this. I'm going to bring the print in. Remove that because I don't need it. I'm telling, hey, student, print yourself. And I'm going to say print the M name. And print the S name. Oh, so M name. MH. Okay? So now, instead of saying set like that and putting address schmadress over there, I simply say ST. Set yourself, ST, print yourself. Okay? It doesn't seem like much to you. I'll say, what the heck, so what the difference? It was outside, now you put it inside. Duh. No, that's not the case. Okay? This is a revolution here. It actually made programming, it made all the things you have possible. With structured programming, we could not write complicated code as we are writing now. We have softwares driving our cars now. Okay? And it's so complicated that it's absolutely impossible to organize your brain using a structured program. To be able to write a complicated code, you need to write the way you think. And that's the only way. And that's object orientation for you. Okay? So now I'm saying student print yourself, student set yourself, and all those stuff. And if I run the program, you will see it works the exact same way. All right? Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? All right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Because of public and private, you have the member functions and member variables, right? 
under public employment. Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. So under public and there is there is this wrong assumption that all data are private and all actions are public. That's not the case. We could have data that is private. There is I, there's a data that I don't care. Okay. If, it's, if there is a data that I do not care if other people change it, it's not going to change the state of my class, sure, I'll make it public if I would need to. Depends on your design. And if there is a function that I don't want anybody to have access to, then I'll make sure that it's not going to work. Every single machinery that you have does the same thing. The only thing that you have public in your computer is your keyboard. Everything else is private. Can you just go over there and fiddle with the Hard disk? No, you can't. You have to write something on your keyboard and therefore using that public function of yours, private properties of the computer will do wonders. Okay? Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? No, that's exactly what I said right now. Public can be anything. Member functions can be public or private. Member variables can be public or private based on the design. There is no absolution on this. You should never think that member functions are public, always. Never. Okay? And whenever, always, do I have access to your heartbeat? No, it's a private function of yours. It's not public. If you run through action that you have, the functionality of your heart dictates that it has to beat faster. You don't tell to your, you have to do faster, no, I can run. No, you can't do that. When you run, automatically that private function is called. And that's what it is. Okay? Oh, of course you can. Of course you can. When the time comes, you're going to see examples for it. Yes. student was a uh, was a class so class student mm -hmm. so by default class is all, as you said class is, a, is private, pub private. public private. private private so if you wanted to make it public uh, public you need to put public class students uh, no no not public class students you put public is you put uh, i you see, this is how you do public you put public in the class so if it was actually a struct to have this thing accomplished, I have to actually have over here private. So either I can do this. Let me just do it like this. So essentially, either I could do this or I can do this. So I'm going to write it like this and leave it like that so you know. So if you write class. You don't need the pri private over here anymore. So either I have to have line 5 and 6, or I can have line 7. Line 7 has privacy in its definition. Are we OK with this? Are we OK? Are we OK 1? Are we OK 2? Yes. Simple question. Uh, always public is coming after private. No, 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 no. You can put, like, it, it's my taste. You want, you can put the public at the beginning and private at, after. So if I, now good, good, good thing. What if I want to have these things down here? What if I want to have these things down here? Then I have to write over here private. <laughs> because now they are falling on their, on their pri uh, public. It's not execution, it's definition. C language goes line by line when it's executing something. When you're creating something, that's your design. You're telling, I want it to look like this. You're not saying anything is getting executed now. OK, execution, you're right. And compiling, you're right. So it compiles and keeps going. You're saying it always goes line by line. So it says, everything after this is public. So it goes here, 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 here. Now you have two variables. You want them to be private, you have to make it private. But if you had it up there, you don't need to do that. OK? I don't like it. I don't know why. I grew up like this. I like, the ve the, I, like to see, I like to see the attributes of my class first. 
I want to, because that tells you what is encapsulated. So my preference is to have these things right at the top. I don't like it at the bottom. Because they actually tell you what the student is. When I look at the first three lines, I see I have a student with a name and an age. That's what I need to be concerned about. Right? Okay. Any questions? One. Any questions? Two. How do we make modules here? First of all, you have to separate the design and the logic. That's number one. We have to separate the design and the logic. When you are doing something, you have the logic in your guts of design. That's not a good thing. We don't want that. You don't want to, like especially when you want to, to use the student somewhere else, that make it, makes it impossible. You can't put the code inside a header file. Then you're going to have the repetition and stuff like that. It's not going to work properly. What you need to do is to separate the declaration and the definition, to separate the introduction and actually business logic. If I want to do that, what you need to do is to have prototypes of the functions inside. So in here, I'm just going to write the prototype exactly like you did in C. So that's a prototype, and that's a prototype. Now there's a problem in here. How do I tell the compiler that set at line 16 belongs to a student. No, actually, it's the easiest, easier way. OK, how do I tell set belongs to the student? All I need to do is to say student. In here, I cannot put dot because this is logic. This is not property. So I put scope resolution. That means, so scope resolution essentially means apostrophe S for a class, not an object. Now it brings me to the next thing. What is the difference between a class and an object? What is the difference between a structure and an object? Anyone? What is the difference? Is that a Mercedes Benz laptop? No? no? OK. <laughs> Looks like they're okay. Anyway, what is the difference between a structure and an object? I haven't told that in class, did I? No. Well, I'm just going to see if uh, you can guess. A structure and object. A structure just is, guess. is it a class and the object is a member of the class? No, no. Okay, if I have integer i, you see the, the statement integer i. What is the difference between int and i? They're both integers. If I say integer age, what is the difference between int and age? Loud, loud. Instance of it. It's an instance of it, right? Age is an instance of int, correct? And age, so age is an integer. But integer is a design of what an integer is supposed to be. The class and an object, the struct and an object, OK? A class is the design. The object is that design being instantiated to an entity. So if I look at my code over here in main, student is the class. An object of student is st. Are we clear with this? So another question for your quiz the next day. I have to open this thing up. To have the questions for the thing. Let me pause for a second. Next time, don't ask, just say paused. So I know. Anyways, lots of these things missed, but I'm sorry. Anyway, so scope resolution is to uh, establish membership. Scope resolution is always used with a class, and it's this one. Okay? To actually access properties of an object of a class, you use dot, which is this one. So in here, I'm saying call the set of st. In here, I'm going to say student has a set that works this way. So in here, if I had another student, 
or I had, if I had an array of students, two students instead of one, I could say st0 set and st0 print, and I could have the exact same thing for the next one. which in this case, it's going to be Fred, and he is 55 years old. And they're all ST0 now. I'm going to make this 1 and 1. So now, what you see, I have two objects of type student. I have one class student and two objects, ST0 and ST1. ST0 has the name for dude. And SD1 is Fred. One is 46, the other one is 55. Right? Are we okay with this? Yes. Not at all. They're absolutely different things. A scope resolution is only used with a class type. Scope resolution with class type, and later on you're going to learn class members, okay? Dot is only used by objects. At left side of a dot, you never see a class name, ever. At left, of the left side of a dot, you cannot see a student, okay? With the scope resolution, I tell to the compiler what set is. With dot, I call that set so it can do something for me. One is to call for action. The other one is to define what an action is. So there are two different things completely. With one, I tell what set is. With the other one, I actually execute the set. Now, how to put these things in modules? Any class in our, for our learning, for the reason we want to learn, we say every module holds one class. So for every class that you have in your application, you should have a separate module. In my case, I have to have a header file over here, and I'm going to call it student.h, student.h, and I'm going to create another one, and I'm going to call student.cpp. You know how these modules work, exactly. So for a student, I ask you in a, in, a, in a quiz, in here you say, if not define, SDDS student, oh, all capital, student, student, H, all right, and then you go define, you copy the same thing, and you paste it, and if we write all our codes, we write all our codes in a namespace SDDS, so that's my module. I include that one student CPP, so I'm going to say include student.h, and I am in namespace, sdds, all right? Now, to bring that module over here, the class always goes to the header file. So I'm going to get the class, put it in a header file. So header files tells, header file tells me what a student is. By looking at it, I'm going to say student is a class that has a name and an age. It can set itself, and it can print itself, right? I don't need to look at the code. How does it set itself? I don't care. Am I pausing? No. Is it a question? OK, go ahead. They are identical. Oh. Minus, the minus, the minus the privacy. Minus the privacy, class and student are, uh, class and, and, and structure are identical. But lately, I found out that behind the scene, the implementation is slightly different. 
which means too rich for our blood. Just letting you know that they are identical in object-oriented terminology. Okay? Uh, and you can act upon it. So anytime you have a structure, you just make it public, be happy that you have your class. Okay? I cannot give you the example for it. What, it for some reason, one is tagged as a structure, the other one is tagged as a class behind the scene. So compiler sees them as two different things, although they are doing identical things. Let's put it this way. Okay? They are both, it's like saying, boat or a floating vehicle. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're identical, but they are tagged differently. Let's put it that way. Okay? No, 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 it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But just to show off that we are doing object orientation, let's use class. Okay? Unless we explicitly tell you, use a structure. So anytime you are dealing with definition of a class, use a class. Don't use a structure for now. Okay? Now that I have the student over here, I'll go in a CPP file and I'll get all the actions that belong to that class and I put it in the CPP file. So the CPP file actually tells me how that thing works. And now, as you see, my header file does not need to include anything because no string header file is used, no C in and C out is used in here. Again, only include where you need it, not in the header file. Okay, so I'm going to come over here and I'm going to take these stuff and I'm going to put them right in the student at the top. So now I have string copy and C out identified. They know they exist. Now I'll go back to my main and in here I'm going to say include student.h and using namespace stds. And there you go. I do not need to do anything anymore. What does it say? I know. It says it's not, un it's not initialized. You, you don't worry about it. Okay? It said warning that it's going to get soon fixed. Okay? So if I run it, it works the exact same way with absolutely no difference. I'm going to have Fardud and Fardad over there and everything's just fine. Okay, so that's essentially what a class looks like with all its stuff that we need. Are we okay down to here? Are we okay? Can we declare always class? Forget about the structure. No. Know that it exists. Why do you want to have the easy way out? Just know that they both exist. Because it, if you just forget about it, when it comes to 3, 4, 5, that you actually need a structure for certain reasons, you say, wait a minute, didn't we just get rid of structures altogether? No. So know that they are doing the same thing. One is public by default, one is private by default. Let's learn it instead of take the easy way out. Okay? Any questions down to here? The class ends at 12.35, right? 12.30? I have 10 minutes. Can I continue the 10 minutes and, or you want to go early because it's... All right, is it too much down to this point? All right, so just let me just... I'll, I'll promise I'll let you know. Go. Let me just...